Do you have a list of questions? No. We're going to go live. That's good. I like. That's fine. It's, we do it live at work all the time. You go with it. So growing up, I grew up in, my dad worked, my mom didn't work, she stayed home with the kids. She did babysitting, stuff like that, like just uh, extra money. My dad was the primary breadwinner. So he would have to work on cars to like, to make a, to keep us going through our day to day lives, basically. So like he worked one week on, one week off. When he came back home for that week off, he was typically always working on one of the family cars. Almost 100%, there was a chance that he's gonna be working on uh, someone's car so i was always out there i think i was probably causing more problems with like than helping him but i was always interested in what he was doing and that kind of drives me to like with my son teaching him sort of like my dad taught me he taught me hard work work on cars mechanical skills stuff like that and he was always doing engine swaps and trucks pulling heads swapping heads on trucks and he'd buy these cars fix them sell them make a few extra dollars here and there so he was always into cars in a way not necessarily at that point in his life not necessarily how i was i'm into cars now i'm in a whole it's a whole different game that i'm in compared to what he was in i would say that now I'm I'm a fanatic with cars. I mean, I'm into Hot Wheels. I'm into collecting cars. I'm into racing cars. I'm into watching people race cars. Anything to deal with cars. All right, so I was working for Toyota for 10 years, turning wrenches. You can, if you've turned wrenches, you can only do it for so long before your body just starts takes a toll on you. And I was getting to that point in my life where I'm like, man, I've really got to figure something out because I cannot, there's no way physically I'll be able to do this much longer, doing this every day, day in, day out. And one of my friends, Andrew Schulte, uh, he worked for Nissan. He's like, hey man, there's an opening. He's like, do you want to apply for it? And I can give, you know, throw your name out there. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. So literally I put my application in and then forgot about it. And probably four months went by. I kept getting this phone call from like Casa Grande. <laughs> And I'm like, I don't even live there. What's in Casper and so? A couple of days go by, they call again. So I finally answer and it was Nissan. And uh, they ended up um, calling me in for an interview. I did good in the interview and uh, ended up getting me a job out there. And I was like, oh, this is, this is different. <laughs> this is a corporate, corporate life. And I'm not used to that. I'm used to being grungy in the shop and, you know, vulgar language. And now I'm being thrown into a corporate world where it's, you've got to watch your P's and Q's and stuff like that. So there's a big adjustment changing career paths like that. So culture at Toyota is like, like going to the bar, let's say. So like you go to the bar, you're going to, you're, you're, talking crap with your friends and cussing swearing whatever you're going you know it's like going to a it's like going to a bar and then when you flip it almost a 180 degrees you're going to work at nissan and that's like going to like a fancy restaurant to eat so you're people appreciate you more they're like oh you did that that's a great job you know or like they're like wow you got that done that fast like they're they're really appreciative for the type of work you do and getting it done i go from working with just like joe blow to working with corporate people and then you have your your travelers that come in from Japan and so there's a cultural difference there that you're having to work with and it's really fun and enjoyable just dealing with all the different cultures and people that you work with there. My dad never really let me wrench on his cars. He's never really, it's always been the, um, the flashlight guy. I'm always the flashlight guy. <laughs> like, hey, get over here and hold this flashlight. You're never... You know, with your parents, you're never the one fixing the car. So like, I didn't start wrenching on cars till I got my own car. I had a Datsun 810 wagon, which I consider my first car. But I had a car a week for one week before that. So I had a Suburban that my parents handed down. I owned it a week, I totaled it. <laughs> so past that, my grandfather was like, you know, I can get you this, uh, this Datsun. He worked at a retirement facility and they, the family was getting rid of their grandparents' car that they couldn't drive. He's like, there's this Datsun here, the, do you want it? 
And I was like, yeah. He's like, it's 200 bucks. I'll get it. So he ended up buying this Datsun. And I'm like, and I'm like, I asked my mom, like, is it a, is it a sports car? Cause I was thinking a Z car. I'm like, oh, this is gonna be awesome. And they're like, no, it's some kind of like sedan. So I was like, oh, it's a Datsun 510. So then I'm really getting hyped up. So I'm like, oh, sweet. This is like an awesome car. And they're like, no, I don't think it's that either. Like this is like a couple of weeks have gone by. I'm like, I wonder what it's gonna be. I'm like, it's gotta be a 510. There's no other cars. Cause like back then the internet was really limited on how much you could search. So like I look up dots and the only thing that comes up is 510s. So my parents go to Texas and they pick up this $200 car. My dad takes it to my grandfather, my grandfather's mechanic. He does a few things to it. He's like, all right, it should make it to Arizona from Texas. It's a 12 hour drive or 14 hour drive. They make the drive 55 miles an hour all the way from Texas to here in this uh, 1978 Datsun station wagon. So it's an 810, it got to the house and it's a station wagon. I'm just like, oh man, it's a station wagon. All right. I wasn't too thrilled because you're a high school kid. What do you, it's a station wagon. That's not cool, but you got a car. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to drive this car. I get it. I start driving. I'm like, man, this thing feels pretty good. It's got some pep in it. You know, it was an inline six and it was only a 2.4 liter fuel injected inline six automatic. So it really wasn't that fast, but I'm like, I'm going to tinker with this thing. So I start like buying parts that I think I'm going to put on there. I bought an MSD kit that's for an American car that people, you don't put that on there and like try wiring up. It doesn't work. So I have to end up wiring it back. So I go to work. I'm like, well, that doesn't work. And, uh, that car kind of got me into modifying cars that, um, so it ended up, I needed to go to college. So my dad's like, I wasn't going to go to UTI here in Arizona. And he's like, you need to gain some life experience. And I'm like, what? He's like, you're going to go to Texas for school. You're going to go to school where I went to school. And I was like, all right. He's like, you're going to learn life there. Cause I've never lived alone. I've never been, a, I've never driven more than 30 minutes from our house. So I pack up all of my stuff, all of my belongings fit. They packed in the back of my Datsun wagon. I'm like, all right. So I pack up everything I own in the back of this wagon. I get in, it's summertime, of course, you know, 110 degrees, 115 degrees outside. I start driving. Don't even make it to Tucson. My car is already overheating. So like I pull over on the side of the road. And I'm hard headed. I don't, I don't need help. I can, I'll figure it out. So I just sit there and wait until nighttime comes. Cause I'm like, well, it'll cool off like 20 or 30 degrees outside. It won't be so hot. So I just sat there at the rest stop waiting for the temperature to drop, make my trek in my Datsun wagon all the way to Texas all night, end up making it. Anyway, I drove that car from college the ne that summer. So I drove it all through college that year, drove it back to Arizona and my dad was like, all right, over the summer we should paint it because the paint was starting to look a little rough. So I sanded it, sanded it and did some primer spots, did some things to it. And uh, he ended up, I went to work, I was working at Toyota already for a summer internship. And he ended up, I came home and he painted it. He sprayed it in the garage. He laid out all of the paper and everything. He ended up, him and my uncle painted it. And I came home like, oh my God, it's like, you're all happy. You got like a new paint job on your car because you were driving this thing that was two different colors for a while. So then it really started to escalate. Like, I'm like, oh, this thing's cool. Cool, let's modify some more. So I, I go end up going back off to uh, college again, drove it back to Texas again, another 14 hour trek across the desert in my Datsun that could do 55. And uh, end up, I'm like, all right, well, I lowered it. So I ended up lowering that car and, and uh, then um, ended up got out of college. I'm still driving my Datsun. This is four years, three years later now. And I'm out of college. I'm going to, I moved to Houston, Texas. Drive it two more years there. So I ended up driving this Datsun station wagon that my grandfather paid $200 for, for like five years. I ended up doing, that's where I learned to work on cars, working on that car. Cause it only failed me like a handful of times and just had to learn how to fix it every time. Dude, that was an experience. So I think I was in between, I had a 64 Falcon at the time. And uh, I'm always talking about Datsuns here at the house. Like Sarah's like tired of hearing about Datsuns, I'm sure at this point in time. So I was online looking at Datsuns on Craigslist, looking at Datsuns on Craigslist and uh, she, uh, no. Yeah, I was looking at Craigslist and I, t I was like, I saw this ad, no picture, Datsun 260Z, 240Z. I was like, what's this? So I click on it. This, la this uh, lady, Charlotte, she ended up having four Datsuns. She had a 260Z, a 240Z, a Fair Lady Roadster, and then a 1600. And I was like, wow. So I email her. Well, I wasn't going to. I just called Sarah about this. And um, she was like, oh, you should see, see about looking at them. So I email her. And then a couple of days go by. 
she emails me pictures because there was no pictures on her ad. And then I start to get a little excited because I'm like, these look fixable. Or at least the one looks fixable. <laughs> and I was like, I think I could buy it and fix it. And, she, and, I, and I was like, nah, I'm not. And then a day goes by and she's like, no, you should. And so she pushes me. She's like, just do it. It's all you talk about is those Dotsons all the time talking about Dotsons. So I was like, all right, all right, all right. So I call the lady and she's like, she's like, oh yeah, I'm a, uh, I'm available, whatever. And so like two days later. And so I end up after a couple of emails getting to that point, it was very slow going cause like we only were emailing at that point and, uh, ended up, I went to her house all the way like in Peoria and, um, she has to move, get to her house and there's like plants all in her driveway, these pot plants potted plants and uh so we have to move all these potted plants out of the way so we can get through her gate we cleared them out and uh i went in her backyard and these cars she still saw them as like nice cars but they've been they were neglected like the 260 that i ended up keeping of the two it was under a carport but the paint faded so bad because it was repainted probably like 80 two or 83 is repainted red instead of the orange or orangish red persimmon and uh, it faded to pink so the car was kind of pink to me it looked really pink and i'm like man this is this is rough and it was dusty because it's been sitting under this carport for 12 years i think at that point and then i go to the 240z which is the one i was more interested in i thought i was until like we get in her backyard and i'm like Man, this thing's really rough too. It, had, it was covered in, apparently a bird was nesting above it and just droppings all over the car. And I'm like, well, neither one are rusted out. Cause like in, for Dotson's, if there's rust, it's gonna be a pretty big road to go down to fix rust. Neither car was rusted. So I was like, all right, I'll make you an offer here. I was like, I can give you 2,500 bucks for both cars. <laughs> and she's like, all right. And I'm like, Kind of stumbled for a second. I'm like, is this thing okay? Like, they need some work. So I was like, all right, I'll go home, get my trailer, come back. So I think I ended up taking the 240Z first. So at the time that that car was put in her backyard, she built a fence around it. So I had to tear down a wooden fence to get it out. And then like it was buried underground, like under the dirt. So I had to like jack it up. And I took one of my friends with me um, from work and thank goodness he went with me because it was a lot of work to get that car out of there because it had weeds growing around it and uh, just real disaster to get it out of there so I ended up we got it out into the alley tore down the fence and put the fence back up for her and headed home got it here and the next day I went back to get the other car the 260 so I go to the 260 and she's like oh for this car I have all this this folder this book and I'm like oh really she had the purchase receipt, the finance paperwork, the everything from when that car was brand new all the way up until that guy put the for sale sign on it. She even had the for sale sign that that guy put on it from when she bought it. And then from that point on, she had all of her receipts all the way to the point where she ended up putting our bill, my bill of sale in there next in that book. So I was like, I, this is the car I'm keeping. This is a factory air conditioning car. And it was the car I didn't think that I was going to want. When people think of Datsuns, they think of 240Z. They don't really think of a 260Z because it's, it's not a 240Z. It's not original. It's not the original race car. No one thinks of it. So they're all the same car. So I ended up choosing that one because it had so much documentation and uh, factory air conditioning car. And it was really unmolested other than the, the old paint job it had on it. I don't own anything that's stock. You look at my car, like even my daily drivers, like I, my GX470, it's lifted on King suspension and wheels and tires and a big front bumper on it. You don't do that to Lexus, but for me, that's, I don't even think of that. That's, I, I'm not gonna drive, I'm not gonna live my everyday life driving something that's just boring. And the same with my wife. She drives an LS400, but it's slammed on 19s she doesn't drive a normal car either. And same with my Datsun, like it was a survivor car. It could have been a survivor car. It is, 
in my way, it's a survivor car. Because for me, I still have all the documentation for that car. Granted, I built it the way I wanted to build it. I'm not gonna let, hey, you could have, it could have been more sought after if it was stock. That doesn't really matter to me. I'm, I wanna enjoy it. I drove it with a stock engine. I drove it with, with uh, stock brakes. People always, you know, when they, when they see that you have modified cars, you see, see, they see my Datsun, they're like, oh, you must, you know, just work at a cush job and just do this and make a ton of money. And like, Nissan provides me, they do good. So like, my wife's in school, she's not working. So like, they, they provide us our house. They provide us for her to be able to go to school and provide, be able to, for my son to go to daycare and start his extra learning before he goes to kindergarten and all that. They provide a lot and they pay me well. For me to be able to do what I want to do to these cars, to like modify them and do be able to go to all these places to get parts and stuff like that, I do side work. So I work on, I do what I used to do at Toyota. I work on people's cars and like that, I just have to, I'll work, get off work and I'll come and work some more to, cause I want, I have that passion to, I want that set of wheels. Like that set of wheels, I waited a year from from to come from Japan. So I want, I want this, I want that for it. So I have to work extra to get these things. So I just put all that into these cars is all, is my passion in cars. So for my cars, 90% of the time, I will not settle to do something a certain way. I want my car the way I want my car. I want my, I want what engine I want in it and I will strive and work to get to that. If I need to sit here and work two more side jobs to get this one part, then I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna work that much harder just to get that rare part or that discontinued part. And I think that's actually a lot of the problem with the up and coming car community is a lot of them I feel like do settle. And I'm not saying that in a bad way, like I'm not hating on anybody, you know, like, but you see people that are like, oh, I'm not gonna buy parts from Japan just because they're expensive. Like, I'm gonna go buy this because it's cheap. It's cheap for a reason. Like, parts from, let's say, not all parts are from Japan are good, but like, for a Japanese car, they're typically better. And I'll strive to get that part, <laughs> you know? And that's kind of why also, like, I like driving my car around a lot. So I want people to see it and I want people to be like, oh, that's so cool. And I want people to come talk to me about it because I want to push that next generation of people to do the same thing. Because if you're just leaving your car in the garage, not driving it, not doing anything with it, yeah, it's cool, it looks nice. Or even those cars that people just trailer to car shows, oh, that's cool, but people see it once a year. No, go out and drive your car, let people see it, let people talk to you about it. Don't tell them not, to, don't like not talk to them, like get them involved, like let them know like what you had to do and what places you got your parts. Because if not, then the hobby's gonna die. Like, it's already, you go to car shows now or go to car meet, you see new cars, lots of new cars. Like, I went to a car show last weekend. I had probably one of the oldest Japanese cars that were there. Everything else was 2014, 2017. To me, that's not cool. That's not, you're not doing anything. You're putting LEDs on your car. That's, oh, yay. But it's not restoring a car. You're not... You know what I mean? It's, there's a guy that walks by and just like, he kind of like, oh, it's just an LS one. It's, it's, it's not the, it's not the cool engine. And I asked him, I'm like, dude, have you ever, you ever owned a car, owned a Datsun or owned a, any vintage car? It's cool to have a vintage car. Don't get me wrong. It's cool. There's a thing about driving a vintage car that's cool too. Like they drive a certain way. And I, I explained it to him, like they're not fast. To make them fast cost a lot of money. And like I said, I work two jobs, two type of jobs to pay to get to where I'm at. I can't afford to spend a $16,000 or $15,000 on a Rebello motor, which will make equal power to what my V8 has. So for people to walk by and just kind of hate on it, I guess, and not appreciate that it's not purist, they've never even owned a purist car, like a real vintage car. Like, so for me, I'm going to do what I want to do and that's going to be the way it is and that's how that car is. It's whatever I want it to be. The specs on my car being that it's a series, it's a early generation 260Z. So there's two series of 260Zs. There's an earlier and a late. 
early ones got the styling cues from a 240Z, so it got the small bumpers, whereas the later 260Zs got impact bumpers. So that's when the United States started deeming like five mile an hour crash rules. So those got the big chunky bumpers to protect you from crash. So you get in an accident, they can impact, they can take a couple miles an hour. My car was specced with the smaller bumpers, so I did get fortunate with that. Um, far as other aero parts, I've got a uh, MSA air dam on it, followed by a skillard front splitter. Uh, originally I did the splitter to protect the the front bumper because it's fiber or the front um, air dam because it's fiberglass and that put a nice sheet of aluminum to protect it. But knowing that I want to go road racing, it'll also help keep the air nice and smooth underneath the car. What I have done to the powertrain is probably the most hated and loved part of the car, I would say, to different individuals, different tastes. It's an LS1 out of a Camaro SS. So it's aluminum block, aluminum head, 5.7 liter, backed with a T56 transmission, six speed manual, with a uh, Shaftmaster's aluminum drive shaft. It was pretty funny <laughs> when I ordered the drive shaft, uh, the guy on the phone's like, is that right? Because the drive shaft was only 22 inches in the car. So, I mean, it's pretty short when it comes to drive shafts. Like, it's tiny. And I'm like, yeah, that's it. And, like, it got here. And that thing, it doesn't weigh anything because it's so tiny. Well, it's like picking up a gallon of milk, basically. It's all fairly stock. It's got headers on it just because you have to have them for the swap. It's got an LS6 intake on it, which is from a Z06 Corvette. But that came with the, with the engine. But overall, it's stock. And that's plenty for that car right now. That car will get up and move out of its way without even thinking about it. It makes probably 330 to the wheels, I'm guessing looking at other people's dyno charts. Then a car that I weighed at 2,500 pounds, power to weight ratio is pretty good. The paint color I chose was the original color of the car, which is uh, persimmon. It's like an orangish red. That's the one thing that really meant the most to me like far as keeping it original that's like the only original thing i wanted on the car was the color so that's why i chose it i was like i gotta take it back to at least the original color to keep some of its nostalgia suspension i'm running billet aluminum front control arms i'm running stance coilovers with camber plates running bigger brakes, running Forerunner big, big brakes in the front, which is, it's a factory setup off of another car. So, I mean, they're bigger brakes for my car, but not necessarily like a Willwood or a Bear brakes or something like that. But there are a four piston caliper up front with a bigger rotor, vented rotor, because factory came with a solid rotor. So you are getting a vented rotor with a four piston caliper. Uh, tires, I'm running um, R888s. Uh, which is a really good R compound tire. Grips the road really nice. It gives you like a, it kind of gives you a false confidence. So it makes you think you can drive better than you really can probably because they hug the road really well. Like they're a really good compound tire. My wheels are a 15 by nine in the front, negative 31. The rears are 15 by 10, negative 31. So they added a good amount of widening to the front and the rear of the car. And for me, they're spot on. I'm not going to, I don't want to change wheels. I specifically ordered those wheels brand new the way they are. And those are the wheels I want. I'm not, there's not going to be a wheel change on the car. The rear brakes are a uh, Maxima, like an 80s Maxima <laughs> rear disc brake setup. Because the car came with factory drum brakes. I mean, they work fine. There's not really a performance gain from going to that disc brake setup. My reasoning is it's simpler. Disc brakes are just so much simpler to deal with. Anybody that's dealt with drum brakes know that it's just a hassle. So for me, just putting the disc brakes was more of just simplicity. So originally the car comes with a booster. When I got my car from uh, Charlotte, the booster was blown out. It had a bolt in the, in the vacuum hose. I drove it like that for a while. I went through two engines with that. I had a 260Z engine in there, which was the factory motor with a four-speed manual. And then I was like, well, I need to upgrade to a five-speed because highway driving on the highway was non-existing because it was just really high RPM. So I was like, well, if I'm going to change the transmission, then I'll go ahead and upgrade to the 280ZX motor. So I got the 280ZX motor, which is originally fuel injected, but I slapped my carburetors on it because I put the dual SU carburetors on it. And I went ahead and ran that for a little while and no booster. So I got used to 
manual brakes on my car. So when I decided to do the motor swap, I contacted a gentleman in uh, Tucson that makes uh, these billet adapters to adapt to a wheel wood and then no booster. And I really like the way that feels. So I went to a one inch master cylinder with no booster and I just like it. That's I like the way it feels. You can feel the road, you can feel how much brake pressure you have to put. It's really nice. Once I get it on the track, it's gonna be nice. It'll, it'll be good. So like a problem that I've always ran into tracking my cars is over braking. I have a big leg and it can produce a lot of force in the brake pedal. And when I have a booster and I get a little anxious on the track, I'll over brake the car. Like I'll push the brakes too hard. And with manual brakes, you don't run into that as much. It's a lot harder to lock them up much less than applying pressure. So I think it's gonna do a lot better than if I had a booster. So the rear camber, I try to keep it about one, one degree of rear camber. The front I run about two and a half degrees. So I don't run a lot of camber, not like any of my drift cars where I was running like six degrees of rear cam or front camber and then about zero camber in the back. Now I add a little bit of camber just because I know I want to be road racing it and so when you're in the turns you want the tire to kind of lift up on itself instead of not. If you're running zero camber it just kind of flop over on itself. Daily driving that suspension setup and that uh, camber and alignment setup that I have it performs good. It's snappier so like the way it's set up feels real snappy and the turns feels good. The car's not done, not not by any means. It has its limitations. We're still we'll sh we're still running a stock Dotson rear rear axle and differential in the back. Which, if you own a Dotson, you know that's not a strong point. That that's a ticking time bomb. I floor it one time. The wheels catch traction. It'll break the axles. So right now, I'm working with a friend of mine. We're trying to develop a rear knuckle setup to run a CV axle and a 350Z diff. So we can use all off the shelf parts. So if we do break something, we can just go to the auto parts store, hey, I need this. To kind of upgrade the car even more from where it's at, make it more reliable. The end goal for this car, I always, I want to road race it. It's almost to that point where I can do that. I've got a, some fuel tank modifications I got to do to keep the fuel from sloshing since the tank wasn't designed for fuel injection. There's no, uh, there's no windage trays in it or anything. So I need to take the tank out, do some modifications to the tank so that in the turns I don't lose fuel pressure or anything like that. At the end goal, we'll be road racing in it and taking it to the track. For me, wanting to keep car hobbies and stuff like that going for the younger generations, I uh, go to the local high school here uh, where my, one of my friends, Eric, is a teacher at. And I'll go there once a year for one day and kind of talk to the kids about different careers there are in working with cars. Because when you're in high school, what do you think of like cars? You're going to, oh, you're a mechanic. They don't know that there's videography, there's photography, there's artwork involved. There's someone has to draw every car that's ever built. There's a clay model of the car. So there's people doing clay with the car. There's just so many different aspects of the automotive industry that kids don't know about. So I try to make it a point once a year to take a day off of work and then go to the high school and kind of just talk to all of his classes about different career paths that they could choose to take. As far as you know, like even engineering, they could do engineering, writing, automotive writing. So there's just lots of different things that uh, not every youth knows about. When my son's my age, I hope, I hope he does something more than me. I hope that he's design. if he's going to be into cars, I hope he's designing cars and developing cars. I don't want him to have to work as hard as I did. I want him to like do use, use his brain more than what I do. But at home, I, I want him to know, I want him to have that passion. Like I want him to have his, his, uh, project car, you know, I don't, I want him to have that drive. And I hope that, and I think that he has that already. Cause he, you look at his room, he's got cars in there. Like, I don't put that stuff in there. He does it. He wants, he wants Hot Wheels. He wants to go fast. His favorite car is our Datsun. Like he likes, right. That is one, like the school asked him his favorite thing to do. And his favorite thing to do with me is go riding in the Datsun. <laughs> and 
it'll be like, oh, just, just make it go fast. And like for him, going fast isn't really going fast. He just wants me to floor it so he gets that feeling of the the being pulled back in the seat and the noises he knows it's a nice car though so like when we get out he'll look at it and be like oh that's nice or he'll, he'll then he'll look at the car next to us and be like that's kind of junky huh and i'm like yeah but you can't really tell people that <laughs> advice i can give to anybody just in general is to just do it if you like cars just do it like you don't want to drive a Honda Civic. You don't want, there's already a hundred Honda Civics out there. Find something vintage. If you want to, if you like a Honda, go get a CC, CVCC or something. Or if you want like a Nissan or a Datsun, go get an older vintage car just to keep the hobby going. And far as like Datsun in particular, 260Zs, 240Zs, that's hard. The advice is hard on that because if you don't do it all stock, then you're going to have someone that hates you for modifying it if you modify it or you don't modify it, then people are going to be asking you why you didn't modify it but finding a car that's not rusted i think is probably the best advice that i can give someone because <laughs> you don't want to have to have rust repair which is really difficult having people not wanting it stock the way they think they should i should have it it's their opinion but it's my car so i built it the way i want it Honey, are you done? <laughs> Honey, yeah. we can hear all of that on the mics. That's all right. We can. can... Help? I thought you were done. No. I love you. <laughs> this whole time? Can you? Yes. Can you go back in the room? <laughs> I thought you were done. They're still. They're still recording right now while you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> That's going in the video too. Yeah, we got bloopers. <laughs> Still recording, honey. <laughs> oh, I love this. This is hilarious.